thank you very much for for joining um and being over here on time on point um stronger don't tell stronger that i said that <laughs> um so uh, welcome to the people that are watching this panel um hopefully we're gonna um make the conversation fruitful and um, have some interesting insights to share uh with you um once again please uh leave a comment and if everything goes well if it's going well from a technical point of view uh where are you watching us from if it's uh not only from Cluj, would be great to to see where you're from um before joining, my name is Stefan for everybody uh, that is uh, watching. And uh, what I would like uh, to kind of kick off the conversation is to um, give yourself a presentation about yourself, what you're doing, where are you right now, in what you are involved. Um, around two, three minutes just for the people that are, jo are joined uh, so they can form like a, a very high level opinion of who you are and what you're doing. So I will give the microphone to the first lady over here that I have on the left. <laughs> Nobody can see which one, what's the position. <laughs> uh, Ksenia, please uh, take the microphone and... Uh... Sure. Uh, so I'm Ksenia Muntan. Yeah. I'm uh, the CEO and uh, co-founder of Planable, which is a collaboration platform for uh, content marketing teams. And we help them uh, organize, coordinate their social media output, um, gather approvals, and we basically revolutionize feedback is currently being shared and taken in uh, in the marketing industry and the entire approval system as well. Um, before uh, Planable, I had a social media marketing uh, agency, so I was in, in the same space, in the same ad world, uh, but now I'm building software to make it better. I'm based in Bucharest and I'm uh, originally from Republic of Moldova. Cool. Thank you very much. We know Plan Planable from a very long time. Uh, yeah. Next, next, <laughs> from Cruz, yeah. <laughs> next one is uh, Ekaterina over here. Oh, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Stefan. Also, fellow uh, uh, from <laughs> Republic of Moldova. <laughs> very, you know, <laughs> uh, proud to be here. Um, my background is in uh, is actually pretty diverse. Uh, I have a five years of experience in a regional management consultancy uh, and my focus is on um, innovation funding and in particular helping uh, tech startups uh, in particular uh, find ways to fund their their startups before investment is available to them great thank you very much uh, next one is going to be Dragos yes hi there I'm uh, Dragos I am a freelance, uh, freelance software developer, technical lead, and uh, occasional public speaker. I love helping startups to articulate articulate their their idea the way I couldn't articulate that word, uh, <laughs> to develop their product, and to actually build their business. So that's kind of what I'm. Doing. Cool. Thank you very much. And Madalina, you're going to have the final word. Yeah, last but hopefully not the least. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Modelina Rakovitsan. I'm a partner with KPMG in Romania. Uh, my role at KPMG is currently to lead what we call people services. So we, in, in people services within KPMG, we provide all sorts of HR advisory uh, services to our clients. My connection with the startup industry, let's say, uh, has been uh, closer in the last couple of years. Uh, and I will talk a little bit more during this panel on how KPMG supports startups and how I worked with startups in the last couple of years. I am based in Bucharest. Uh, KPMG has its main offices in Bucharest. Of course, we have an office in Cluj. And I'm originally from Alba Iulia, so, so I'm really close to, to any Cluj event. And I love uh, being in Cluj and in, in Transylvania in general. So I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you very much, Madalina. Um, and you're right. We're going to talk a lot about how can startups can collaborate with uh, a bigger enterprises slash corporates. Um, so, uh, do you people that are watching, you know that the panel is called Start Up Your Innovation, and we're going to talk about how to kick off innovation within your organization, within an ecosystem, um, uh, within small and medium businesses. What would be necessary for you to kind of kick off innovation, and what is innovation at the beginning? So, 
the way I'm going to do it is yeah, I'm going to have questions that are going to be targeted to the entire group and then questions that I'm going to um, handpick uh, our deal panelists today and ask them a specific thing that would be interesting to get to know their opinion on. So the first question is, what is innovation? And it's targeted to the entire group. So I would like to keep the order that I selected at the beginning. Would be great for you to kind of give me your answers on the very, very first simple question. What is innovation from your perspective? Um, so I'll start, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think from our point of view as, as a startup, innovation is um, is a way of transforming what you're building and um, actually um, completely changing processes or completely changing a market um, and bringing new uh, ingenious ways of solving specific problems. And in the end, I think from a startup perspective, in the end, I think innovation is very much about uh, delivering something meaningful to customers and solving customer problems in a way they have never thought about it. Right? It's like the you know um, the car and the horses uh, story, right? Like if you would have asked people what they wanted in terms of you know they would they would have said you know a better horse. Uh, instead of a car, because people can't imagine that that type of uh, you know innovation, and it's your uh, role as a company, as a startup, to uh, to invent that, uh, to find better uh, and more um, revolutionary ways of solving specific customer problems. Um, so yeah, I think that's that's kind of what how I see uh, you know the angle I I, I take on innovation is uh, more than anything the uh, customer angle. Okay. Cool, great, thank you. Katarina? All right, so uh, really tough to, <laughs> to say something new after what Xenia mentioned because this is what they're doing hands on every day and uh, the product is really innovative and they know better than anyone. Um, I would just maybe, maybe add or uh, what to me innovation means is either making something better, more efficient, not necessarily cheaper, but doing something that solves a problem in a way that creates value, maybe in, in an unusual, in, in a novel way, but in the end it has to be better, it has to solve the problem in a better, more efficient way, uh, or create a new market entirely, right? Sometimes it's not something that builds on top of something existing, but it could be a new product or a new niche altogether, something you would never even imagine before. So that probably is innovation too. Awesome. Thank you very much. Dragos? Yes, well, uh, to continue this train of uh, conversation, what I would add to the already great definition provided by Xenia and Katrina would be this uh, element of in this interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary exploration, so to say. So for me, innovation is actually going above and beyond your own bucket and seeing how the thing you are great at can apply in other areas and how the things that other people are great at could actually help you create something, I don't know, something amazing. So yeah, that's awesome. Much. Cool. Thank you. Madalina? Well, it's, it's getting tougher and tougher, I guess. <laughs> um, but You're very unlucky being the last one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, maybe you will change the order. Next I will change. Time. I will change the order. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, there's nothing much to add, but the way we see innovation at KPMG, at least in KPMG, we are very, uh, you know, interested in innovation and we want our people to be innovative as well. Um, and the way we see it, you know, sometimes people think that you need to be the new Einstein or the new, I don't know, uh, whoever, Steve Jobs or whoever. But actually, innovation can be a simple thing which you can do differently uh, in your day-to-day -day work. And this is something we really want to, um, you know, encourage our people at least and also our clients to think differently. And I think it's getting sometimes out of your comfort zone, out of the, you know, having an out-of-the-box idea and thinking differently to a specific problem. And it is about solving problems, either your own problems or somebody else's problems. 
but then thinking creatively uh, to solve that problem. I okay. hope uh, it added some. Uh, Definitely. And uh, the, the next question, which is also dark, uh, directed uh, towards the entire group, and then um, I have some, some things that I can um, uh, question, question uh, each one of you. Um, I'm going to start with you, Madalina, and the question, in, uh, it sounds like this. Um, what drives in the innovation? What is behind innovation? Because innovation, we have it on a small scale, and we have a large scale. When I say small scale, it could be a really simple thing. I don't know, how can I write emails better, right? Or mm -hmm. not get involved at all. Mm -hmm. To scale of an ecosystem to, to say, how can we have more better products in Romania, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not only uh, trading uh, services or just, you know, know-how. So the question is, and I'm going to repeat, what drives innovation from your point of view? I think, um for me what really drives innovation is passion in a way and i know it sounds really weird but this is what it sounds to me i mean as long as you are passionate about the subject the topic anything and you really get involved into that specific topic or subject you know you 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 need to you you will learn more about it but then beyond passion, you really need to connect dots with something else, you know, to the outside world. Because if you are really specialized, then you only see your little own bits. But then if you think about that topic from an outside perspective and you start connecting the dots with the outside world, then I think innovation will come at some point. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Dragos, what would be your answer to that question? Well, I'm sure a lot of factors that I maybe can't even imagine are driving innovation, but I think the most, the most inspiring one for me is innovation being driven by necessity. Because I think that, you know, when you have a lack of, you know, resources, when, when, you, feel, when you feel a lack of, of something that you want, then you are kind of forced to to go into the direction to getting that thing. And I'm, I'm talking especially, and I don't know, limited resources as in money, as in connections and as in all that, when you are kind of under, under the, I don't know what, how to call it, but in the lack of those resources, I think that can be a really, really motivating factor that could drive you to innovation because by definition, you can only overcome those obstacles by innovating stuff. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Ekaterina. I really wished I was the last one to say something <laughs> about it, but um, well, actually, uh, uh, what Madalina said, what Drager said, kind of uh, touches upon how I see the drivers of innovation. I would say it's something, or it's an ability to connect the two in a way, or to connect the necessity with the passion, or maybe with some vision. Because, say, someone might feel a necessity for a particular thing, but then they might not necessarily have the vision or this drive or the passion to look for new ways, for better ways to, to get that thing or to design something. So it's probably also this some kind of uh, fifth sense or a vision, something beyond the practical that makes people or companies find ways to connect those dots and address those necessities in new ways. Got it. Thank you. Xenia? I want to expand on the necessity part a little bit. Um, there's different types of necessities that could drive innovation. And I think innovation most of the time is driven by challenges and by pressure, um, either competition that might you know, drive you to find ways of innovating your product and uh, you know, taking it to the next level, you know, transforming it in a totally new way so that you can, you know, so, you, so that you don't feel that pressure from competition anymore. Um, it could be also driven by your own personal challenges, like in my own case with, with Planable, uh, trying to solve some of my uh, frustrations back in my agency days, I ended up building an innovative product for that specific market. And then I think, just worldwide events like you know a pandemic drives innovation uh, very much um or uh just you know world 
life changing things that happen. It's very common known that words drive innovation. Um, sometimes not the best type of innovation. <laughs> I'm not saying that's encourage words in any kind of way, but basically pressure combined with challenges, combined with technological advancement and just world world events um, drives drives um, uh, innovation. Awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Xenia. Uh, only on that thing, uh, on the pressure part, what I always like to say that good quality innovation or innovation is when, uh, or growth, right? Uh, when you have pressure and support in the same time, is something that um, fuels uh, growth and innovation in the same time. So I think something that maybe sometimes in, in different contexts and in terms of innovation, the support uh, is missing um, quite a lot. Um, Okay, so let's go to kind of a separate questions uh, that I would like to pick your brains on. And um, the first question is going to go to Chong, uh, to, uh, sorry, Chongo, Chongo is not here. <laughs> um, but uh, the first question is going to go to Madalina. And um, uh, I would like to ask you, how can an established company like KPMG um, start up innovation in Romania? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, uh, Stefan. So I'll just uh, uh, share with you what KPMG has been uh, in Romania has been doing in the last couple of years. So we started a program two years ago uh, with the Spheric Accelerator and the program was called KPMG Growpad. Mm -hmm. where we uh, chose uh, in two years, we had 12 startups, which we supported uh, to accelerate them in a way uh, and to give them the necessary support to grow their business. And these were mainly B2B startups or startups which had B2B products, uh, usually in the tech space. And also another uh, important factor which we took into account was uh, that the product somehow complemented, let's say, KPMG services. So to give you an example, we had uh, or the, the startups which I work with uh, closely in this program, I was also involved in helping some of the startups. And because uh, I'm in charge with delivering HR advisory services to our clients, some of the startups and we had four startups in the two year program where uh, the startups offered HR technologies yeah, for companies. And they were really interesting. I mean, all the all the startups which I've seen in this program were really, you know, hardworking, driven people, business oriented, and we really enjoyed working with them. So this is one way we, we used to support uh, the startup community in Romania in the last couple of years. Now the program has ended uh, and we will not continue with its form as we knew it uh, in the last two years. But we, this doesn't mean that we completely stopped uh, our support to the startup community, but our uh, involvement continues uh, in, in the coming, in, in currently, um, with uh, similar uh, startups uh, mm. which offer B2B uh, products. Uh, however, uh, we tailor made, um, you know, the, the approach to, to, to this support uh, we offer to them, depending on specific needs of the startups and depending on how that uh, startup uh, ties up with, uh, with our offering in a way. Got it. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that, Madalina. I know that KPMG is doing uh, a lot of stuff and helping the ecosystem. Um, so we are looking to have that a continuous thing uh we definitely need it as an ecosystem um so thank you once again and my next question is going to be but before going to my next question chongor welcome to the panelists and uh i will come back to you with a question i'm gonna put you right now on on the like last last uh, spot and i'm gonna come back to your question and i'm gonna give you the mic to also present you of what you do but before that we're gonna go to to dragos for a quick question um, Dragos, from your experience um, being as a freelancer and being involved in this space of uh, engineering, right, more than um, maybe, let's say, the business side, uh, what is it that we are missing out and um, 
doing more in Romania, right? What is some, some things that we don't do and what are the, the things that we do more of and we should do less maybe? Well, in terms of the innovation, in terms of the, you know, the entire context of innovation and startup building. All right. Well, well first thing, that's a really great question. And I think from my, my personal perspective, the thing that we are missing out the most in Romania and should definitely be doing more of is encouraging people, young people, I don't know, students in particular, to, to actually explore above and beyond their own buckets. To try to see how what they know could be applied in other places and how it could link up with other people and create something beautiful. Because, you know, everyone is asking, like, why don't we have more successful entrepreneurs? Why don't we have more businesses that work on their own product? And I think the answer is because we are not properly encouraging young people in particular to, to, to go into this direction. And uh, because, you know, people actually reach their highest levels of innov innovative creativity when they are young. And we also know what motivates young people. I mean, you've all been there, you know, we're not motivating by, motivated by, I don't know, stopping climate change and any world hunger, no. Us young people, for us, the strongest two motivators are love and money, in that order. And while you cannot make, a, I don't know, a computer science student fall in love with the concept of the business model canvas and customer persona and financial projections, you could at least make him interested in those areas with money. And this is something that we are really, really bad at. And I can give you a concrete example of that because I can talk not only from the perspective of someone that is deeply entrenched into this engineering world, but also as a student that just graduated this summer. And let me tell you, I felt it like on my own skin, like how, how, how we are messing this up like big times. So I was studying really quickly. I studied computer science at Babish Boy University. And throughout the semesters, we would receive all these flyers and posters and emails advertising coding contests. And those contests, man, those people would come up with some really, really tough problems. And you would be surprised that the student, student could come even close to solving such a problem. However, some of them did. And when they did, they would be rewarded big times. They would, I don't know, win the latest iPhone or a gaming laptop or a couple thousand euros. You know, strongly motivating prizes. Now, the problem was that there were only, as a computer science student, it would be really hard to find anything else than that. And I'm talking from the point of view of someone that is actually interested in the startup work. I could barely find something, I don't know, interdisciplinary. And this is how we totally messed it up because we would have this like very awkward tentatives of, I don't know, entrepreneurship courses or little small business contests for the computer science guy that would always end up in a piece of paper and that's it. And I mean, we are students, you know, we're not thinking, okay, in 20 years, maybe I will be able to apply the wonderful concepts learned in this course. No, we are thinking, okay, I want to go out with my friends tonight without having my landlord throw me out next month because I cannot pay the rent. And from this point of view, you know, spending two or three months in an entrepreneurship course that ends up with a piece of paper is a waste of time. And this is basically the lesson that we are teaching to our young people, to our students. Stay in your bucket, everything will be fine. Just go out there and be hardworking. And don't look beyond it because the moment you do, you will realize that it was a waste of time for you. And I think, you know, I think this is not an unsolvable problem. I think the solution is actually to, you know, to motivate young people to explore other areas with real money. You know, organize some kind of contest like, okay, take someone from computer science, someone from business, someone from medical school, put them together and be clear. We don't want to know how talented you all are in your own like buckets. We want to know how you can put everything together and create something. And just put like 3,000 euros as a head, as a heading, as a, you know, prize for that and watch it like just go wild. And this will be basically my, my message to the academic world, but especially to the startup and corporate world. If you want more entrepreneurs, more successful entrepreneurs, if you want more businesses working on their own product, then start motivating young people, start encouraging them to go in that direction. And not with 
digital like diplomas and uh, mentorship sessions and funny stickers no do it with real money that would be my my, my take on on uh, what's missing right now from our ecosystem okay great thank you very much Dragos. i do agree universities should maybe get involved more in the ecosystem and supporting that uh that uh, important factor of innovating and building more products uh and the very important thing that you mentioned money and this leads me to my next question um to ekaterina and my i would be curious and you know um interested into the entire context of building innovative um products or just in the phase of innovation when do we choose funding and specifically eu funding you being an expert on that area all right so it, it's a bit of a, a big jump or a stretch from uh, the really motivational <laughs> speech that dragos just said and i'm still uh, uh reminiscing there uh well if we jump to straight to already the startup phase or you, let's say you have a team you have a product you have some traction uh you guys maybe your first customers you have an mvp you have some signals that what you're building that you, you did something right there right you're on the right track uh you might be considering looking into some grant funding it's a great way to get some extra resources to continue building what you're building if uh, you get those positive signals that uh, what you're doing is right and there is potential you don't want to give away your company right there at that point uh this could be another uh, important criteria or a question to ask yourself as a founder or as a team uh probably you already have to have something set up as stock admin like you have a company set up it has already maybe a year or two of uh traction because like looking from the donors perspective they want to see something real not just uh, you know a team that is trying to put something together and will probably waste that money it's how some donors might see it so uh it should appear good on paper let's say as well so there are some papers involved uh and depending from the from the call or the, the industry you're in or the the products you're building there are different options right but the basics are more or less uh these that i mentioned cool thank you very much katarina um before going into the next question for our dear listeners just so that you know we're navigating all the discussions and all the questions um when you are listening to what our panelists are giving you as um information as insights as perspectives are all connected from in, in a context of innovation and kind of what needs to be happen to 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 happen in in um uh in a broad spectrum of innovation innovation as a whole is really big and it's really complex so that's why I take um what you are listening um from our panelists as ingredients as um specific tactics to what you can do and apply to your specific need or context um on this note if you have uh specific uh, questions to where you are right now uh within your or your organization it could be an ngo it could be a startup it could be uh you are a manager somewhere inside a company and you are interested about maybe innovation tactics strategies or you have a specific question drop your question in the comment section that will help us help us a lot um at the end of the conversation uh where we will uh kindly re, um give you answers ask the question to the panelists so uh going to our next um question is xenia and the question would be what are some of the downsides of innovation right um you being at the front line of building a, a tech startup what would be something that um would be a downside of that sure so i'll ask i'll answer this from the perspective of uh an operating startup uh already like you know a few years in you mm -hmm. have a product on the market it's all going well and you know here's the question of innovation uh you know maybe expanding the product or, or building a new product or building you know something different in your currently existing product and i've thought about it and i think i see three downsides to innovation first of all it takes a lot of time innovation takes a lot a lot of time um and a lot of resources but most 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 of all it takes a lot of time and, and that's not something that's not a resource startups 
have you know readily available uh we don't have plenty of time uh to wait you know for innovation to uh to be developed the second one innovation takes a lot of resources i already mentioned and it, it mm -hmm. takes a lot of money and i know ekaterina touched on uh funding uh, that's you know not always easy to access uh, vc funding is hard to access but also you know grants and other you know non-equity uh, funding is you know it's not as easy uh, as well um so it's not again you know easily available to startups and you have to invest a lot and then the third uh, downside i would say is the fact that innovation um i mean you don't know it's innovation until it is <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense, but like you work on it and it's unproven until it's like until it's proven on the market. But for that entire period of time, you put in a lot of resources and then you wait a lot of time until, you know, it's proven by the market that, yes, that's innovative or not. That, that's, you know, just some, you know, a, a useless thing that no one wants. You know, that's not innovation. Right. Uh, but you don't you do go through that research and development process for a lot of time and you might might end up with something that you know distracted you from something that you know in your business already works and i think that you know this like uh, fear of building innovation is what killed a lot of companies you know we have something that works it's really great you know why venture in this on this innovation path uh, because it has this huge downside of building something that might end up not being useful for the market I think this factor of you know, innovation not being proven until it's proven um, is, is a huge downside. Yeah, um, I, I super agree. And one thing that also in the comments are happening, uh, Gabi said a downside would be for a tech startup to innovate in a, such a way that could be a way ahead of time yeah. uh, and also launching in the wrong country. So yes, uh, those are really, really true statements, Gabi um you really have to be careful around what you are building for what kind of market and be mindful about the timing that you are doing it yeah uh, and the uh, intellectual property part is very very valid especially for like product companies like uh, physical product companies that very you know very you've seen stories you know on the web with companies launching on kickstarter and then you know um <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I mean, it's going well, but then, you know, uh, uh, Chinese uh, fabrics uh, stalling, uh, stealing their, uh, you know, patents and ideas and designs. And uh, it's really some types of innovations are really hard to uh, protect. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, going uh, to our next uh, next uh, question. Uh, but before giving uh, giving away the question chongor could you just uh, say in two minutes uh who you are and what you do yeah absolutely sorry for missing the beginning of the session i was just confused with time zones and i thought we are starting in 20 minutes from now so so sorry about it sitting no in worries. from budapest uh hi my name is chongor i'm a startup community guy i've been uh, involved in you know improving the local entrepreneurial ecosystem in the past eight years right now i'm a managing director of a new ngo called startup hungary which is a fairly typical national grassroots startup organization. What is special about it that we managed to convince all the poster child successful funders from Hungary who already either exited their business or, or made big success stories on an international level, like the funders of Prezi, Ustream, and other successful company funders to, to join this initiative as funders. Uh, Forbes actually quoted our launch back in June as uh, the, in, the, the institutionalizing of the startup, the Hungarian startup mafia. And I'm the managing director of this organization and we are uh, trying to do as much as we can to supercharge the local ecosystem. That's uh, you, you, took, uh, you took on your shoulders a really big mission. So congrats on that, on the fact that you kind of built uh, around you, put together all the, um, uh, all the stars from, from the tech industry. We definitely need it also to, ha to happen in Romania. I think we already have <clears throat> kind, of, um, uh, kind of an initiative. Um, so going into my question, Chongor, uh, is what would be some key spots where the ecosystem stakeholders should collaborate in order to spark innovation? 
Yeah, uh, I think, you know, Brad Feld, uh, the founder of Techstars, has an amazing book on startup communities. Uh, the, the name of the book is Startup Communities. And he says that in order to improve the innovation ecosystem, you need to engage the entire entrepreneurial stack. So you need to make platforms where aspiring entrepreneurs can meet with, meet with serial entrepreneurs. You need platforms where corporate innovators can also meet with startups. You need platforms where investors and startups meet, where the university programs uh, can engage with, with, with local innovative minds and, and encourage entrepreneurship. So I think it's a very complex uh, system and you need to design engagement opportunities between all these various stakeholder types. Um, and yeah, I think it's important that it's happening not just on the local level, but also on the regional level. Uh, being early ecosystems in the region, I think we don't yet have that sort of density of startups like in other major ecosystems like Berlin, London, or the Bay Area. So, but actually one big advantage of our region is the proximity between these hubs. So it's very easy for me to drive to Bratislava, Vienna, you know, even go to Prague, every kind of these city, these, these CE startup cities are, are a few hours from each other. Uh, given that, I don't think that generally the community know each other too much. So any kind of uh, collaboration where, where we are aware of the complete regional scene is beneficial for the startups because they just have more peers to, to share and discuss challenges. And it's also beneficial for us as a region because if we can present ourselves together in a united way, we have much better chances to gain awareness for Western European US investors and other stakeholders. Uh, that's super, super true. Uh, we definitely need, I mean, the, the fact that we are so, so close, um, it, we, can, we can breach that gap and start collaborating more. Um, now, taking offside the current context that we have um, as uh, we're living right now in, in full pandemic, but we still can do this online. Um, oh, we do need somebody to spark that. <laughs> um nonetheless right um hopefully that's gonna happen and have more for the more dynamics over there um my next question would be uh, addressed to somebody that would like to pick up this question uh from from you the panelists uh so the question would be and whoever wants to kind of answer just say yes and then we're gonna pick randomly right um, if we borrow right borrow or copy from more advanced economies um, is it still innovation? Adelina. Yeah, you know, the, I heard that there is a, a Chinese saying uh, for copyright, which is copyright. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that would be the answer for that. To me, um, you know, copying or taking an idea which was developed, uh, you know, in a different area, region, and redoing it to uh, uh, and to adjust it to the local market i think that's still innovation i mean think about emag i mean yeah. that's a copy paste yeah it's a copy paste of amazon but is the amazon of romania in a way and yeah. you cannot say that emag is not an innovative company i mean you can say many things but this you cannot say i suppose i mean i i cannot say and you know it's just an example but for sure um there are plenty of ideas uh, we can see in a different country, but what we need to do is for sure adapt them to the local market and to the needs of the local customer or whoever is the beneficiary of that new product, new service. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, you were both on. <laughs> <laughs> in the same time. Ladies first. Uh, Ekaterina, please go ahead. All right. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to build on Madalina's point and I was thinking the same. Probably when you have the customer, uh, you know, at the center or keeping the, the client or the, the target market, you name it, in mind. Uh, if you adapt something to another market, probably it's innovation to them, right? Because it's something new. Maybe it addresses a problem they have or they feel in ways they didn't have before from product perspective or in the maybe larger global scale might not be innovation in itself. 
product speaking, but from a customer perspective, something might be innovative. So it depends on the perspective you're looking at from. Right, correct. And now, Chongor, back to you. Yeah, just uh, just a few thoughts on this. I think we need to think about innovation as a spectrum. And on one side of the spectrum, there is, let's say, incremental innovation, which let's say, you know, like a car manufacturer comes up with a new car every year. And that's sort of like an incremental innovation. It's get faster, better every year. And on the other side of the spectrum, there is disruptive innovation, which just, you know, creates completely new markets and uh, disrupts existing market players. And I think, you know, what we are talking about here is somewhere in the middle, let's say, a resegmented innovation. Uh, geographically meaning we segmenting and you know there is a good saying that you know the future is here but it's not evenly distributed and obviously there are plenty of uh, plenty of services business models that are not yet uh, made in our region or in Europe and I think there are very cool businesses who kind of we, we sometimes call these copycat businesses and I think you know Germany with Rocket Internet and the Sunberg Brothers prove that it's possible to create very valuable, very cool companies. That said, I am sometimes recommending choosing this path, uh, not choosing this path for the local startups in Hungary, just because Hungary is such a small mar market. I think, you know, I think we are actually not small enough. I think Estonia is, is, it has a benefit of, of being smaller than Hungary because they are just so small that they need to think global by default. <laughs> Whereas you know we are we are kind of in the spot with our 10 million population that you know we kind of believe that hey it can be but actually it can be just a lifestyle business and it's very hard to scale and 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 I think you know Poland and Romania and, and, and Germany and with all these big domestic markets you can build up pretty valuable companies but I think uh, we should focus on building more original kind of global innovation businesses. Uh, I thought I thought you were you were picking the hand again, Madalina. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, I I agree with that, and I think uh, you know um, having uh, companies like similar to Rocket Internet could add uh, some value to to the ecosystem. Um, but coming back to to uh, Estonia um, and connecting to what we had uh, earlier mentioned, uh, lack of resources, right? So Estonia had a lack of what people, market, right? So by having the lack of that, uh, they automatically put themselves in creating the first, I don't know, I'm kind of allowing myself not having the due diligence done on my part and kind of um, um, saying this on from what I know and what I've read, they've built the first e-government systems, right? And system which other countries are right now considering adopting, which is in itself an innovation. So that that is super, super cool that you mentioned that uh, Chongor. Um, is there anybody else that would like to touch some uh, some perspectives on that question? And just some ideas on Estonia and leverage the kind of to, to continue on Chamber's uh, point as well, maybe or combining the two is that you have to also uh, be very aware of the uh, competitive advantages or just the features of the country you are in and just make the best of it. Let's say if you continue talking about Estonia, it's such a small country. We can talk about our countries as well, that it's easy to test new things. The, the market is not that large. You can see how things work, let's say, in a smaller sample before making a technology available in a global market. So, you know, you turn a disadvantage into an advantage. And there are many other points like that in the markets we're in. Correct. Yes. Um, I will go right now into, again, uh, some questions that I will uh, direct to, to you specifically, uh, and I'm going to name you. And we're going to start with somebody that hasn't uh, said anything for a while, and that would be Xenia. Um, <clears throat> and the question would be, um, did collaboration, uh, and when I say collaboration, I say it because in innovation, we need that as an, as an uh, elementary piece in terms of innovation to happen, right? So did collaboration play an important role in your startup's growth, and what was it? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I think, in a way, definitely, uh, in a way, for sure, we're three co-founders, so there's been collaboration in that for sure. Uh, and then we, um, you know, we have VCs that are backing us, um, so that's that's also important. 
um, but not in the terms of like collaborating with other startups or uh, with, with other base businesses or with corporates. Um, you know, accelerators, yes. Programs that we've been in, yes. You know, you could say that that's collaboration as well. Um, you know, freelancers, contractors, all of that stuff. You know, we obviously have a lot of people that have helped us along the way, mentors and, and people that we've worked with but not necessarily collaboration with with the corporates for some reason um maybe i didn't try the right ones or we didn't get in the right ones but uh the ten the you know the the tries that we've had of, of collaborating with uh, with corporates didn't really work out and maybe that's you know because of the product we have or the market we have um but i wouldn't say that played the most important role in the success of our business so far Maybe that's something we're going to have success with down the road. Okay. Okay. What was some of the things that were for you successful and um, move the needle in terms of in terms of driving innovation? Um, uh, yeah, and growth. Yeah, um, accelerators for sure, a hundred percent. Um, getting into tech stars and getting, you know, uh, being part of their community, um, very, you know, having those role models in front of us, but also very early on with Spheric, you know, getting that support from people that have gone through building startups and, you know, uh, hearing them say that we, we have something, you know, in there, <laughs> there's some golden nugget that we have with, with our business. Uh, getting that kind of support from them, I think that's what you know drove the needle quite a lot. And then you know, um, investment money—that's uh, you know extremely important. You can't build you know a business without that. Um, but the just the you know the support of the mentors and and in the accelerators and the the communities that we've been and you know just seeing others succeed as all uh, as you know seeing that it's possible. Um, I think that helped a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I will now move to, to Dragos and uh, ask him from like from your position of uh, being a tech lead or um, being involved in, in, in the trenches, like you said, of engineering, where do you, you see or meet blockers for innovation? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Well, from my experience as a freelancer, as a tech lead, as a person that has to kind of work with people in different environments and different backgrounds uh what i can call a blocker is again coming back to kind of my original theme is people not being able to deal very well with things beyond their own buckets and i'm not saying that as and people just don't know anything beyond that it's just that i i often feel this kind of retention uh when I talk to people from like radically different backgrounds, for example, someone from a medical sphere and someone for the deeply technical and someone for a business side, I always feel this kind of, of kind of retention to deal with that person from the radically different field because you don't really know much about them. You have no idea how to take them, how to make yourself understand, how to understand them. And that's kind of a thing that that yeah, I, I see I see as a blocker and the solution, I don't know, man, it's, it's, it's a really tough one. And I think I can go back again to my point with the young people, with the students, with so on, because the way I see it, like, we are most likely to encounter people from radically different backgrounds, radically different areas when we are students, because that's when all the student associations and all the parties and all the team buildings are happening. So you're unavoidably going to stumble upon them. And right then, I, I feel like it's the prime time to, you know, get to understand those kind of people from other areas. Now, the problem was that with that is I don't really see, in most cases, you know, any, any incentive to go beyond anything else than just, okay, let's party, let's hang out, let's have a night out, and that was it. So even if you are bringing together really smart, really smart kids from different areas, they won't go to something like, Okay, this is what I know, this is what you know, let's see how we could maybe build something together. I'm not saying that, it's just okay, let's party because we have a lot of other worries on our heads, we have our exams, we have our rent, we have that, that, that. So as long as 
and this is my my deep feeling that as long as we won't have a way in which young people will see clearly that exploring beyond their buckets and reaching out to other people will help them with their most urgent problems like you know rent and exams and so on they won't do it because you know as young people it's really hard to get us actually focused on something so yeah that would be that would be my perspective on that just learning how to and, and having the courage to deal with people from radically different environments I, I think the lack of it is quite of a big uh, a big block for for innovation so I like, um one of the one of the panels that i joined today is uh, um w one of one of the panelists over there said that um we definitely need coaches more coaches and from what you said um i think it kind of fits very well that we need coaches we need facilitators and role models things that i have already men been mentioned over here in terms of you know how to uh, deal better with uh, uh with team members uh how to um better communicate and so and so on our needs and also then the group the, the group needs so i kind of i kind of agree with with uh, where you're coming from um my next question is going to be um towards um stronger and uh, i would be super interested to find to find out from from your perspective how do you think we could apply some of the western practices to the east faster <sighs> That's a tough question. Uh, I think, you know, if we are talking about the um, VC scene, uh, I think, you know, like more co-investments with investing players would be would be really nice. Uh, I think, you know, also the fact that Western European or US VCs are opening up more and more to the region also helps the fact since you know if there is bigger competition for the money it will result to better terms and i think you know these kind of international standards will just uh, fly in because uh local vc players will realize that if i'm not showing the same funder friendly approach as their western european and u.s counterparts they're just gonna lose the good deals and i think it's already happening and uh we can accelerate this by opening up the tar startups eyes to think more global and 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 uh, not just look uh, inside of their borders um so i think that's already happening uh obviously like international accelerator programs are gay great uh you know i think we should get more startups into yc and and 500 startups and all these top tier accelerators so they can they can expand their knowledge and their network and then after the program they can bring it back and and, and influence it i think one cool thing is really to have sort of like startup visa programs uh and, and and stuff like that i think with with, with covid and, and all this pandemic the bird and the startup world will become less centralized and less bay area focused i think like a lot of great uh tech professionals and funders currently are leaving the bay area because they realize that it's not and they are looking for exotic not so obvious locations so i think if we can import good people you know we be either entrepreneurs, tech professionals, that will also bring sort of like the Western standards with it. We definitely need more competition in the country. So if we bring more uh, smarter people that are more competitive, hopefully it's gonna spark more yeah. competition. Yeah, I think Startup Chile did an ex ex amazing stuff with their program regarding that, you know, they basically didn't have a startup ecosystem existing. They had this non-activity program and had, uh, you know, startups from all around the world go there. And it was just parking for their innovation ecosystem. Uh, I think it was a, it was an amazing uh, investment from the Chilean, Chilean government. I, I think, I think uh, your comments come really great in, uh, I mean, come exactly on, uh, on a topic that I would like to ask Madalina about, and that is uh, global, yes, Dragos. I would just like to add a little idea on that, like adopting Western, uh, Western like, kind of way of working in the East. And I think that this, the way this pandemic affected the things that we are doing is really going to work for in, in, in favor of that, because, you know, we've always had this kind of 
uh, cultural difference with the West because they are like this crazy capitalist that just go from a real young age and sell lemonade and all that. And, you know, being in this like Eastern communist bloc, we would always feel like kind of isolated from them and that we don't have access to all the resources, all the networks, everything that they have, that they have. And then bam, this pandemic hit and now all of a sudden all of our conferences are online and we can really easily like just participate in some kind of event that we wouldn't even dream of before because it's online. And I think that these kinds of like changes in the way of doing things would really facilitate us into adopting this kind of more Western mindset when it comes to business, when it comes to innovation and, and so on. Yeah, I agree. I agree that the digital the digital kind of infrastructure is bridging the borders and bridging the gap between the cultural differences uh, and the biases that we have towards that. Uh, very good point, Dragos. Thank you for that. Continuing uh, on what I started uh, saying is the fact that, you know, um, um, people, human resources and global traveling is something that um, Madalina is very well aware and has been involved. And I would be really interested to kind of find out because uh, find out uh, uh, some some aspects of it because we are living like in super interesting times right now. And um, when it comes to working remote, right, Chongo, as you said, that people are uh, open to leave the Bay Area and so on and working remote. Um, Madalina, what changed so far and where are we heading? in terms of human resources management, working remote and all, all that part. What's your take on that? Well, I would start by saying um, I wish I had a crystal ball with me to answer your question. <laughs> but uh, beyond that, um, you know, remote working is definitely something I'm really interested in. Um, and I'm really interested in because uh, I can see in the marketplace that this is something that is here to stay. I mean, for sure, in the last six or seven months, everyone or most companies, uh, you know, send their employees to work remotely, but usually from home, but not necessarily. Um, and a lot of companies uh, who maybe last year or until uh, March thought that remote working is not for them for different reasons um, had, you know, were confronted with this new reality and had to cope with it. And actually, they started to realize that uh, remote working actually is not that bad. Uh, and there are some positive aspects to it. And of course, like in anything, there are good things and less good things. I won't call them bad things. But for sure, there are advantages and disadvantages, and disadvantages of remote working. Um, but what we noted, uh, at least on the Romanian market, is that uh, companies, even beyond pandemic, I mean, let's assume tomorrow there is no pandemic anymore, that's you know uh, just a pure imagination, um, but let's assume that uh, we spoke to a lot of companies in the last couple of months, and many of them, and I say majority, or a big percentage of them, uh, want to keep remote working as an option uh, or even as a policy for their employees, so they don't want actually people to come back to the office full time as we were doing uh, last year or until uh, until March. And, you know, this is something which I think is changing a lot of things and changing the business model in a way and the way people work. Uh, but of course, there is a lot of change in how we will manage our people uh, in a hybrid type of uh, environment because, you know, I think that uh, beyond pandemic, companies will be in a hybrid type of uh, work environment. I don't think that everyone will continue to work from home forever and companies will just disintegrate and they will have, they will have no head office. Then we will keep offices. Um, however, their role would be completely different than what we were used to. And we see that, you know, a lot of companies um, think about uh, keeping their employees in remote working uh, for most of their time. 
and bringing them to the office for uh you know socializing creating or keeping the culture of the organization keeping you know team spirit uh engagement of the people motivation which are you know very soft aspects but when you think about them they are really important for uh you know the the success of a company and you know what we see by talking to our clients is that uh, you know there is a real interest in remote working and how the new reality of work will look like in six months a year two years three years time uh, but for sure i think hybrid work is here to stay for a long time uh, and it will definitely change a lot of the processes as we as we know them that's the I, uh... your question yeah, it, it does. It definitely does. Um, I was uh, in. I, I mean, the, the the reason why I was asking that question is, bec uh, is because I believe that um, within this unfortunate time, uh, companies will also have the opportunity to um, find new ways of working, um, and this is connected to specifically to their uh, workforce. And I think they're going to be forced into navigating and developing new ways of how to lead in a virtual team how to manage virtual teams how to manage the entire kpis mm -hmm. and all, all that part and i think there's a lot of innovation that's going to happen inside the companies but also innovation within that spectrum mm -hmm. of managing resources uh you know i don't know who knows what kind of new products will will pop up <laughs> Yeah, we look, forward, we look forward to those uh, to those products and ideas. And you know, as Xenia was uh, saying earlier, you know, pandemic and wars and you know, bad things that happen in on on this planet drive innovation. And for sure, uh, you know, the, the the lessons which we learned during the pandemic is that there can be a new way of working and you know this is here to stay and therefore you know this can drive uh, you know a lot of innovation in the area of uh, of the of the way of working let's say yeah um i agree moving to our next question which is going to be a group question and um we're going to start off uh with chongor um the question is and something that we are very similar in terms of countries specifically here in the CE region. Um, and I believe you, you, will be, you will be able to articulate that very well as well. Um, the question is, how do you think software development houses and shops, right, companies, can innovate? Because they are in a very traditional business model, right, service-based business model. What is um, the entire group's perspective, opinion of how the companies can innovate and become maybe a more product centric uh, company? Yeah, I think it's, it? it's very tough. Uh, I think it's, it's very hard for the, I mean, we have in Romania and obviously all in the region, they are pretty successful uh, dev shops and, and, and software houses and agencies. And I think most of them have the ambition that one day they should productize and, and you know, launch a startup. I think it's very hard since, you know, when you are doing a startup, your most, your biggest resource is time and focus. And it's very, very hard to, to divide your attention between running your software business and paying the bills and, and doing the product. Most of the success, and actually we know quite a few success stories that manage to do this. For example, there was a there was a mobile agency called Distinction in Hungary a couple of years ago, which was acquired by Skyscanner, and then they became the the basically the the mobile headquarters Skyscanner in, in Hungary. Ustream, you know, the founder of Ustream previously did the the, the, the dev shop and the consult, software consultancy business, and 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 also Bitrise, which is currently the hottest startup in, in Hungary. You know, they went through Y Combinator since then. They raised Series B uh, from notable international investors. They were also kind of a software house. And what I see that, you know, all these companies at one point really stopped the service business and, and completely changed their focus. They saved some money uh, that would give them a comfortable runway of one, two years, and they just completely stopped it. I'm not a big believer of, 
of you know doing both at the same time i think it's not really manageable you know in a software house business you either have the problem of having two less clients and you need to do a lot of sales or you have just too much clients and you don't have enough resources and 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 this is just a terrible nightmare to to try to save up some time and dedicate a few people from your team to to work on the product business so i would i would encourage everybody with this ambition to save enough money that they can drop the the software consultancy business I don't think the two thing is really manageable. At the same time, obviously there are exceptions, but, but that's my take on it. Awesome, thank you very much, Jonkor. That's very, very, very well. That was, that is something that we see as well over here. Um, who would like to be the next uh, person to kind of ask, uh, uh, respond to the question? I can. I'm gonna go ahead, Drago. Uh, so. You were talking about the small software businesses kind of innovate a way to innovate. Just yeah, how they can yes, how they can innovate, and it could be even larger companies. It don't, it don't, they don't have to be like 10, 20 employees. It could be 50, 100. How they could innovate? Well, we have this thing, and it's kind of an innovation that is not very public and not very like the thing you see, but we have. In software, in software development, we have this term of open source. And I think uh, Xenia and maybe Gabi in the comments will hate me when I will define that because they were talking about intellectual property. And the open source is basically just throwing everything you have, all your work with all the details, throwing it on the internet and having other people come in and add some stuff and improve it and make it better. And so in, in this way, like make life easier for all the other developers. So. And this is a thing that I really see, like in really small companies. Like the the company that I first uh, worked and worked with had around I don't know 25 employees, and some of them were like really really smart guys that would just contribute to open source software, to things that were out there on the internet, just with the uh, with the with the thought of helping other developers making making their lives easier and making it easier for them to you know to innovate in their own way if they're working on their own product so on so yeah this is like i think the main way in which we are currently innovating and will probably just grow from that point but yeah as in for more like obvious more kind of uh, pr worthy innovation i i don't really have an answer in my mind right now but yeah that's okay open open source is a really valid uh, valid point and i do know a couple of successful stories and that is uh, the um open street department from uh, telenav that was uh, a kluge based company Skobler, that was founded by a, a german founder philip uh, kendall uh, so he uh, built um, a software house on open source and then later on got acquired by telenav which was a really cool thing as a successful story uh, next, uh, I would like to go to uh, Ekaterina and uh, just uh, give me your perspective on how software houses could uh, could innovate from where you stand. Uh, well, a tough one for me, actually. I don't have that much experience in working with software uh, houses, but from what I've seen in, uh, in my previous work, I think it's important to find a niche and really don't like not try to cover all the bases because it's practically impossible to do a good job there like you really want to specialize on something and build the capacity and some core competences there be it uh, still the consultancy or the ser uh, service side or building the product uh, and if moving towards or pivoting towards developing an in-house product or spin-offs, probably it's important, as Chamber said, to really be mindful about your limited resources and prioritizing them properly, maybe keeping in the transition side your key customer that's a cash cow and really be having a strategy to transition towards that product side. Um, also, probably it's important to have um, a clear vision of your go-to market strategy afterwards, right? Moving away from the service business to the product business, it's the market is different, the, the, the sales strategy is different. Probably taking into consideration your network or your client base is important to inform the strategy you have moving forward. Uh, so as to not give up something that potentially could be a better 
option than moving into a product that might have potential, but you don't have necessarily the resources and the network to, to start off right. Um, so yeah, uh, mindfulness about resources and prioritization and really being uh, clear about the niche. Uh, uh, Katarina, I don't know what you're talking about. You mentioned at the beginning that you are not a <laughs> specialist in this space, but you kind of nailed out a really cool strategy about how you... So, uh, well, not a specialist, but I uh, had some right. experience. I mean, you, you, you nailed field. out. Uh, I mean, you nailed out a really cool strategy in terms of how software houses can um, ease their way in transitioning into a product-centric or product-based company. So that's super cool. Thank you for that, Ekaterina. Uh, Xenia, what is your opinion on that? Oh God. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know. I had an agency and I, I closed it when I started my, you know, my startup. So <laughs> that's the strategy I approached it. I just stopped doing it and I moved to the product. Once it was validated, there was a bit of an overlap, I have to be honest. Uh, like I wanted to, to, <laughs> to see if it works before doing it. Um, but it, that overlap was very hard. Uh, it was terribly hard to manage clients and you know, go through an accelerator in parallel. Um, and yeah, you know, at some point you just gotta make up your mind and decide what you wanna, you know, what you wanna do with, with what, you know, you wanna move, move forward. And I agree so much with uh, Katrina that the, just like, you know, the product and the service, and I think Chungur mentioned that as well, that it's two different worlds and there's like, um, a transition period where you have to adapt and like switch your mind to think in a very very different way um like the metrics and everything is is different so um you need to adapt to it and you, you need to give yourself a bit of time to adjust to that awesome thank you very much i was i was um, pinpointing the question exactly on you because i know that you've transitioned so uh, thank you for that input um, I'm going to go to my final round of questions that is going to be uh, handpicked for you. Can I add uh, something, Stefan, on, on this one? Because yeah. I was thinking and, you know, I don't have a lot of uh, experience with the uh, tech companies, but, you know, I was thinking and I, about them and in a way they are very similar to our own consulting business. Um, and for sure, you know, the way I see it, they need a culture of innovation. And I think the organizational culture and the leadership, which, you know, supports innovation in the company, I think it, they are crucial to, uh, for, for those companies to really innovate. And yeah. it's again about the people, because I've seen people in tech companies uh, who innovated and created new products, but they were allowed uh, with enough time and resources to create their own product which was then taken over by the tech company and then you know taken out uh, on the market and uh, what they were really successful and i think it's about culture and leadership to, from my perspective talking about people yeah yeah i i agree uh, i agree very much on that and i think uh uh, culture is something. First of all, I think I skipped you on it's, that uh, group question. So, uh, apologies for that. Uh, but coming back to the culture, I super agree on that. And I think in our prep, uh, in our prep conversations, we we touched a bit on the subject around the culture, the fact that Romania is kind of coming from a, um, a culture that is, you know, a communist regime, and we are super focused on engineering driven, um, you know skills uh and not so much on the business side on the go-to-market uh, uh go-to-market strategies um and specifically you know marketing and state and sales so what i do also believe is that culture is super important when it comes to building new products and innovating so maybe you know software um, development houses can think about um uh, those aspects as well uh, when building or trying to transition into product-based companies. Uh, moving on to, like I said, my kind of final round, uh, the questions, because we are still, we still have 12 minutes up until our, our session finishes. Uh, and I would like to go to Chongor with, um, uh, with a really good question uh, that I like. And that is, what would you expect from a, a, a stronger partnership and collaboration between CECDs? 
Uh, I would expect more core investments. I think these are already happening. There are several Hungarian startups, for example, that received investment from, let's say, Credo and Credo Ventures and Day One Capital from Hungary uh, are doing core investments, but I'd like to see more of these. Uh, mm -hmm. And like more syndicates between angels, like on a regional level. Uh, I'd like to also see more companies that are, you know, going and and just you know more platforms where, you know, senior stage companies can share uh, their challenges and their you know their solutions with each other. So just more conversation and discussion between between peers of startups. Uh, and uh, yeah, pretty much that's it. I think more discussions and more co-investments. Awesome, thank you very much. I definitely um, like the fact of uh, creating more syndicates around business angels. That would become a super force for the region. Um, they definitely should start talking more. Um, like Cosmin said in one of the panels that I joined, uh, we are too segregated in terms of demographics um in terms of uh, the the business angel groups so definitely a syndicate would be great um moving on to uh madalina or back to madalina um would be great to if you could give me some examples of things that c startups are missing in general um that would be one of one, one of the things and then one of the things that are missing when they are approaching corporates since you are coming from a corporate side some of the things that they're missing when they're coming to, you know, KPMG specifically mm -hmm. right now, and they're asking for a proof of concept or a partnership and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the things I see or I saw uh, in certain startup initiatives were that, you know, they developed a product. Uh, they were, you know, usually in love, so to speak, with their product. Uh, but they haven't thought about their uh, potential buyers or potential customers to understand how to re how do how their product really responds to their needs and also how to pitch in front of a potential customer in front of a potential customer. I'm talking here specifically to B two B about B two B type of businesses or products. Uh, because you go there uh, at a corporate to pitch in front of a corporate and you need to think about what's in it for them. And if that product saves them 2,000 euros, then maybe, you know, for them it's it doesn't sound interesting, if, even if your product is amazing. But then if you have a small product which saves them 100,000 euros, then we talk different things. And, you know, it's just putting yourself in the shoes of that potential customer and understanding, trying to think um, their perspective about their perspective and pitching, you know, to meet those potential expectations. And I think, you know, what what startups some sometimes miss. I'm not saying that all startups really miss, but some of them really miss a, an early thinking about a go-to-market strategy and they focus maybe too much on their product development, additional features, functionalities, and they think less or too late about go-to-market strategy. And maybe something they can also do is create those diverse teams, which Dragos was also talking about, you know, diverse team, diverse perspective when they uh, put together the product, which would help them really have different perspective and think of, all potential angles uh, as early as possible. Does thank you. Help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. It does very much. Um, I, I, me personally, I'm super, super fan of that uh, of go to market strategies and putting some more money uh, on the marketing aspect um, because we can see also in the governmental structure funding initiatives uh, like we had Startup Nation you could see clearly that the balance of the budget was imbalanced and highly um, budgeted in towards building hardware or, you know, and not having at all, I mean, or having a very small piece for employees and building IP. Mm -hmm. um, 
moving on, uh, what I would like to ask uh, Ekaterina and um, around uh, around money, right? Around EU funding, what would be um, or what are the top three most important aspects for startups to take when considering EU funding? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, there are a few things, and we I know we have limited time. I would start with product, even though we we just uh, talked about this uh, overly intense focus on the product and engineering part, and just falling in love with your tech. Uh, but still, in terms of EU funding, it's important to have a product that's differentiated from the market. It either creates a new niche uh, or very clearly addresses a very acute need in a new way. Uh, also considering if you should consider the specific donor or the specific funding call priorities, right? It could be something focused on environment or technology or strictly software, like depends on the on the call. So you should bear this in mind as well. Uh, traction, you should prove that uh, you have already some initial signal from the market, as I've said before, that it's working and it deserves uh, quote unquote, uh, the, the funding to be developed further to reach the next stage. Uh, also, very important is, and coming back to the point about sales and marketing, but uh, generally speaking, is the team. You have to have a complementary team that is prepared uh, to cover all those bases and to work in tandem to get the product to market and probably having an a team that's really tilted towards the tech and with little sales marketing business acumen in general will probably not get you very far and it's something to work on. Um, having a clear vision where you want to get with that funding is really important to demonstrate and the IP point that we discussed earlier as well. We should have those assets that can really uh, differentiate you from the market, something that you can protect and that can really make you stay ahead of the competition in the long term. Uh, would probably some of, be some of the main points and then there are specific topics to cover inside all of Thank you, thank well. you Katarina for, for that, that you kind of nailed it <laughs> with exactly specific things that you have to have. Um, Due to the fact that we have only four minutes left, I will move to uh, a group question that I would like to um, for you to answer, um, all of you. And that would be something maybe that comes uh, maybe as a challenge to you um, and um, an advice, right, to the listeners and to somebody that maybe could carry on the message uh, from you towards, uh, towards um, somebody that would 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 need it and uh, the question would be if you could do um if you could do it tomorrow uh and you know how it would uh, it would uh, no for example a, a simpler way to say it um what would you do tomorrow if you knew that it would move the needle in innovation in romania and i'm gonna pick on who's one who's who's ready who's first <laughs> but um if if i can do if i could do it tomorrow and if i if i had all the money in the world or maybe not all but some important money um i would probably do something in education and i know dragos touched a lot uh, about it um but i think that we need to talk about innovation from very early ages and to talk to children about innovation and you know if we want to build a culture of innovation in romania i think we need to teach young children and to start with young children i mean you saw my my little one she's six and a half uh, almost seven um and i think you know she would really need uh, to see what innovation is at this age and to start early and then we can really build a, you know, we can really grow a generation of young people in 20 years time who are interesting in, interested in innovation and would be able to drive innovation in the future in Romania. So, you know, and I would probably invest from kindergarten to universities and probably I would put more money into universities because uh, probably the return on investment is uh, higher there than uh, in young children. Uh, but still, uh, this is probably how I would spend uh, some good money. 
Awesome. Thank you very much. I'm just making over here a note as well yes. um, as final remarks from you. Well, um, I could go on real quickly. Uh, Drago, I Drago, I, whatever the hell I wanted and I had all the resources, I would just team up with Modelina and we would revolutionize the, the, the educational system in this entrepreneurial manner. And a concrete example of that, I would just create a program where we would take like people from all kinds of university and faculties and specialities and so on, put them together, make it clear that we're not looking for individual expertise, but for innovation, for the innovation that can come out, out of the collective. And I would slam like out there in the top, like a huge prize for first, second and third, and third place and just see what happens. If you're actually doing this like really seriously and not just promising them like, I don't know, mentorship session in digital and digital certificates. So yeah, Madalina, we can talk afterwards. <laughs> awesome, thank you very much. Ksenia, go ahead. Um, I would I would build, uh, and that's very obvious, you know, uh, considering my experience going through uh, two accelerators, I, I would build an accelerator with, that would, you know, come with a solid, solid investment, you know, at least 20, 30K. Uh, it's extremely important to just get things started something like you know um i want to say something like tech stars because that's you know that's pretty big but maybe something like startup wise guys you know since we've been talking about estonia today uh so something like you know um startup wise guys and um you know with a very strong uh portfolio of, of mentors that have gone through uh, building businesses and you know just cherry picking the best entrepreneurs in romania or in the region and uh, you know, enrolling them as mentors in, in the program. I think that's extremely important to just uh, get those people's role models and, you know, have very early stage startups learn from their own experience. And I think that's inspiring and motivational on one hand, but on the other hand, those are the actual people uh, you can learn from about building startups. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, this would be the thing, in my opinion, that would really move things forward. Awesome. Thank you very much. Build an accelerator. Yep. I can continue. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I would uh, probably like on the more realistic uh, Go wild. or Go wild. Like, actionable uh, way. I would probably no, no. Uh, I would probably uh, talk to I don't know ten entrepreneurs tomorrow to see what's holding them back from moving forward. And there was a great question in the chat: Do you believe that people in the region dare to innovate? So there are people who dare to innovate and there are people who have what it takes, but maybe don't dare. So I would probably talk to them and see what's holding them back and maybe try to help them either with the help of Xenia, Madalina, Dragos or Changor or Stefan or some other people we could connect them to. Uh, but uh, on a larger scale, I would uh, really, uh, what Xenia said really resonates with me and I would find ways to bring more knowledge and practical experience and uh, find ways to pass it along to to students or uh, to to first-time entrepreneurs let's say to give them that kick that they need uh, to believe more in, in what they do and what they want to do and just uh, share awesome. those thank uh, you best very practices. much chongor you have the last word thanks thank uh, i think uh, i would focus on no pressure i would focus on uh, making the role models more visible and the good stories more visible and close to the people. And I would focus on this, uh, just uh, echoing what Ekaterina said about changing the mindset to think bigger and showing them the proof, showing the community the proof that there is no reason why we should think that it's not possible to build global businesses from this part of the world and just showing more and more examples and potentially you know just sending people to international accelerators and and also like internship to berlin or london or or the us and and just have them bring back the the knowledge and the mindset that they can acquire there thank you very much i just made the final note over there in the group um, looking at what we uh, what we discussed or your responses to uh, the final question, I would say let's team up and do something about it. <laughs> I'm all in. Um, we can definitely start a debate, a national debate around innovation and how can we speed up more product centric uh, product centric companies in Romania. Um, 
uh, we definitely would would come into um, kind of a support to uh, already grassroots uh, existing organizations that all are already doing that, and we are happy that we're it, it's it's happening. Um, but yeah, I think uh, each one each of uh, one of us has to get involved in some way or uh, or another into growing that either by talking to your friends, right, Dragos, or to um, more, um, you know, to, to entrepreneurs that are not innovating yet and do not see a specific angle or perspective that it could be done with, you know, small amounts, small uh, of, uh, of resources and uh, change into a more product centric company. Uh, our time has run up. Um, I think we don't have any other questions. Uh, Ekaterina, you just picked it up from, from Shandor. Uh, so I would like to thank you very much for joining today and giving uh, your time. Uh, you, you dedicated uh, one hour and a half to share your wisdom and insights uh, with a cool audience from Collision Innovation Days. Um, and I hope um, it was worth it. And um, let's uh, let's let let's spark innovation in Romania. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for awesome. That. Innovation Days 2020 is part of the Future Skills Lifelong Learning Program. The project is co-financed from the European Social Fund through the Human Capital Operational Program 2014-2020.